Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chi. Appreciate it. Welcome to, to Gibby and everybody else who is here. Please go ahead. We have Laylee Watts, one of our youth who will chair the meeting tonight. We are very indebted to her who gives her time uh, to us in order to for the youth to have a presence in our firesides. Please go ahead, Laylee. Of course. Thank you for, for giving us this space as well. Um, so today our speaker is Dr. Phelps, and Dr. Phelps has received a dual bachelor's degrees in physics and philosophy from Stanford University and a PhD in physics from Princeton University, specializing in cosmology. He worked at the Baha'i World Center for 13 years in Haifa, Israel, in its research department, where he coordinated the indexing and the collation of the Baha'i sacred writings and their translation from Persian and Arabic into English. During that period, he concurrently held an appointment in the physics department at the Tekion University in Haifa and published original research on the masses of nearby galaxies. He currently resides in Portland, Oregon. Today, Dr. Phelps will explore how the Baha'i faith, one of the most recent religions of the world, addresses the values and goals of enlightenment thought. Thank you for being here today. Well, thank you all for coming. Let me share my screen. Uh, I do have a few things to share. Um, the first being a picture of my family, since there are friends here who I haven't seen in a long time. So I send greetings from my beloved wife, Catherine, and our, and our three daughters. Um, I, uh, as, as per usual, am um, in the position of throwing together things at the last minute. And so what you're going to see is not so much nicely organized slides, but more kind of speaker notes that have been thrown down on, on slides. So uh, here are some, here are some of my thoughts about, uh, about this massive topic. Um, the Enlightenment, as many of us uh, may have studied uh, in, in school, um, was a, um, uh, a major intellectual movement in, uh, in Europe uh, in the 17th century, primarily. Um, although the dates of the Enlightenment uh, are given as somewhere between you know, the late 1600s and, and early 1800s, uh, the Enlightenment is still very relevant to today. Uh, because it was the most influential in intellectual movement um, of its time, and we still live in its shadow in in, in very important ways. Um, the and and likewise, we live in the shadow of the scientific revolution, which preceded the Enlightenment and can be thought of in in some way as paired with the Enlightenment as two phases of of, of one movement. Uh, the scientific revolution, beginning with uh, traditionally, with the um, publication of the Copernicus, uh, Copernicus's uh, book detailing the the heliocentric um, system uh, for the solar system, uh, and ending with the publication of Isaac Newton's uh, Principia Mathematica, which lays out the the laws of motion, which so revolutionized our understanding of the universe. 
Um, and this massive success in in the science of the scientific revolution uh, of the of the late 1500s, 1600s, uh, which was based on this newfound appreciation for the power of reason, uh, combined with the evidence of the senses, uh, put together in a in a um, in a systematic way to investigate phenomena, the incredible success of the scientific revolution led uh, people naturally to want to apply the same method to other domains of human behavior. We can think of the Enlightenment as being um, a, a, uh, a successor to the scientific, revolu scientific revolution in the sense that um, in the sense that that it was uh, thought that well we if if applying reasoning and the evidence of the senses can, can unfold some of the mysteries of the of the cosmos and we understand the motions of the planets and we understand even the motions of physical bodies uh, on, on this earth uh, and, and all the other things that rapidly followed from this scientific revolution then what if we apply the same principle to politics to religion to all other aspects uh, of human endeavor um, and and this really led uh, to the the modern age that we live in in, in so many ways which is contrasted so sharply with the age of tradition that preceded it. This traditional age um, uh, which, uh, in which people saw there being sources of knowledge which were beyond doubt and were beyond question. Uh, a, a traditional age where there were received authorities, authorities who were taken to be the final word on the subject whether the, the, those authorities were spiritual in the case of prophets and the holy books that they brought, or whether those authorities were scientific uh, or philosophical in the case of Aristotle, in the case of Ptolemy, in the case of Galen with science. Some of these authorities, their, um, their influence uh, continued for over a thousand years, sometimes 2000 years. Uh, and people didn't question what these authorities said because it was assumed that they spoke from a kind of position of, uh, of, uh, of infallible knowledge. This traditional concept of the world, which permeated human thought in all departments of life, be it religious, be it political, be it, uh, be it practical, uh, this traditional way of life was completely upended by the scientific revolution and, and the enlightenment. Um, and we can say that we can we can say in brief, although a, a historian would do a much better job th than I at um, at, at even summarizing this. But one might say in brief that it was the triumph of the application of reason, of rationality to the world, uh, and our uh, on our using the evidence of the senses, which gave us humanity the idea that maybe each individual possesses this power of reasoning, this rational power to perceive the truth directly. And if this was the case with the scientific revolution, um, these people, these scientists who arose didn't arise from the, from the class of the clerics or from, the, from royalty. Um, they were, these were ordinary people who were able to make these, uh, these great discoveries. Um, and if that is the case, then perhaps individuals also have, uh, should have some voice in how they govern themselves as well. Perhaps the, the kings that ruled absolutely over them, perhaps the power of the church, of the clergy, whose power was, was absolute, uh, perhaps those also would give way uh, to this newly discovered sense of the individual and the power of, of the individual, uh, which was contained in their uh, in their minds, in their in, in their power of, of reasoning, and so the political implications then of the um, of the Enlightenment should be should be clear from this the, uh, this movement away from various forms of authoritarianism uh, and towards more more democratic uh, forms of governance. Um, the, the theme of the Enlightenment can be summed up uh, in, in a couple of, of, of nice ways. One is the motto of the Royal Society of London, one of the oldest, if not the oldest, um, 
society uh, of scientists uh, dating back to the to the mid 1600s uh, in Latin nullius in verba, which which can be translated to mean take no one's word for it. Uh, no one has authority over you. Um, no one's word is intrinsically better than yours. Uh, ultimately, the test of words will be reason and the evidence of the senses. Similarly, Immanuel Kant, one of the great figures of the of the Enlightenment, um, in the in its later stages, uh, in in his uh, essay called "What Is Enlightenment." Uh, defines it as following. Enlightenment is man's emergence from his self-imposed immaturity. Dare to know, have courage to use your own understanding. That is the motto of enlightenment. So the results of this tremendous upheaval in human thought with this, um, with this introduction of systematic reasoning uh, and investigation, empirical investigation of the world, has led, as we all know, to an explosion of knowledge, particularly systematic knowledge that builds on itself from generation to generation, which has led human civilization to this exponential ascent uh, in so many ways. Um, of course, very obviously with this knowledge, we have so many ways of controlling, of shaping our environment, building such wondrous machines like the one we are communicating through right now, curing diseases, extending human lifespans, flying through the air, otherwise moving around the planet swiftly, feeding multitudes of people, um, communicating across uh, the globe instantaneously. So our material life has been improved in countless ways by this explosion of knowledge. At the, the same time, we have a better understanding of the context of human life on this planet. We have a sense of deep time. We know the origins and fate of our world. We know that our world goes back so far beyond the, the, the history of our, of our race, so far beyond the few thousand years that our oldest texts, our oldest sacred texts uh, have record of, um, so far back that our minds are actually not even capable of grasp, grasping it because we don't think naturally in terms of powers of 10. We can think in terms of, oh, this is 10 times you know, bigger than that. But when you get to something like this is 10 million times bigger than that, these are words and we can write down the zeros because we've learned the math, but we really can't intuit how big uh, a span of time, something like 10 million years is, or 100 million years or a billion years. And, uh, and those are the sorts of, of time frames that we now know we reside within, we humans on this planet. We resume with, we, we exist and all of human history exists as a tiny moment uh, within this vast stretch of time that stretches both before us and after us. And similarly, we know how big the universe is. We have a sense of deep space, of the vastness of the cosmos, which is so, so much bigger than our planet. It's hard for us even to intuit how big our own planet is because our, our whole lives are spent typically in such a small circle of uh, a, a small patch of, of, of land uh, on our planet, except when we get in an airplane and magically a few hours later come out in another country, even though that doesn't really help build our intuition about just how vast our own planet is, let alone our solar system, let alone our galaxy, let alone all of the other hundreds of millions, perhaps infinite numbers of other galaxies uh, out just in the visible portion of our unit, uh, universe. So let alone the possibility of there being other um, other dimensions even beyond those dimensions that we can directly observe, dimensions of, of space and time, of parallel universe and so forth. We're, we're into the realm of metaphysics, but we, we know for sure that, that the universe, the observable material universe is so much bigger than us. It's too big for our local narratives, our stories, our religions, our philosophies. We're written for a people at living in a place, living at a time uh, in which the universe was so much smaller than we now understand it to be. Um, the, our, our mod, which is, and this modern understanding of the vastness of space and time, which is really only about a century old, only about as maybe a couple centuries old when we talk about deep time. Um, it's been really far, not nearly enough time for it to really sink into our consciousness and really sink in that 
that the stories we've been telling us, the, the, the narratives, even our sacred narratives, are far too local to space and time to be fully embracing. Um, it, it forces us to a, a humble acknowledgement of the relativity of all of our knowledge, whether we take that knowledge to be um, the knowledge of our material world or whether we take that knowledge to be the knowledge of the ultimate realities of things. So what has been the, the place or what is the place of religion in this, in this new and this new understanding of reality brought about by the age of enlightenment that we all live in. Of course, it depends on who you ask. Um, the enlightenment narrative is quite simple. A set of bad ideas has been replaced by a set of better ideas. The bad ideas, of course, being superstitious religious beliefs, narratives that have oppressed one, one group of people or another, narratives that have oppressed our own individual capacities to think uh, on our own, uh, that's the, the enlightenment narrative that, um, that we have a um, tremendous leap forward uh, in, in civilization that has um, swept away the detritus of the past and set us on, on a new course. From the perspective, of course, of, of a traditional religious narrative, uh, one looks at this huge, at this huge explosion of knowledge, um, with some skepticism, because at the same time one sees an emptying of the churches, one sees a secularization of society, one sees uh, a turn towards uh, a, extreme forms of selfish individualism, uh, of of materialism, of obsession with uh, things of no lasting consequence. Perhaps at best, one might say from a traditional religious narrative that we, yes, we produce mountains of knowledge from the scientific revolution and everything that's followed. Uh, some of this knowledge may be useful, some of it may be dangerous, but we don't, and we haven't developed in parallel the wisdom to wield that knowledge. And so as one can expect, there have been various reactions to the modern age and this age, this age of enlightenment from various uh, religious quarters um, that, uh, that, are, that may be fighting each other theologically, but may be agreeing with each other fundamentally that the modern world uh, has somehow taken a step in, in the wrong direction. So those are setting out you know, the two, two kind of extreme positions on the Enlightenment. This was a great thing, and we're, we're now on, on, a, on, a better, on a better course, or this is a uh, this is a catastrophe, uh, and humanity has strayed from its God uh, with severe consequences to follow. One way of, of describing this catastrophe from a, a religious perspective uh, quite beautifully was the sociologist Peter Berger, who talks about the impact of the Enlightenment uh, on, uh, on the world uh, in, with, in, quite subtly as, as something which is felt differently in different places. You know, we here talking from Canada and from the United States have a particular view on uh, on uh, on this historical process. Uh, but the Enlightenment has touched and reached different countries, different cultures, uh, differently. Uh, even today, even even in the modern age, there are parts of the world that are not quite as impacted as we in the uh, in the West are. Uh, one thing that uh, Peter Berger says: there's con there continues to be religious and theological milieu in which the crisis is at its most dimly sensed as an external threat in the distance. In other milieu, the crisis is beginning to be felt, but is still on its way. And yet other milieu, the crisis is in full eruption as a threat to deep inside the fabric of religious practice, faith, and thought. And in some places, it is as if the believer or theologian were standing in a landscape of smoldering ruins. Uh, and that last uh, that last option, I think, is may maybe the best definition of the of the secular West from the perspective of the religious believer. It's a landscape of smoldering ruins, of uh, empty churches and uh, and populations that have um, that are even in this generation, even in the last ten or twenty years, the statistics are a far far less um, far less uh, acknowledgement of adherence to any particular religious tradition or or belief in God. Although it's still quite strong in in the in the U.S. and Canada, uh, at least compared to compared to some countries in Europe. 
So what is the next stage then? You know, we, we have, we're, we're in the midst of this, uh, of, this, of this revolution in human thought, which really began a few centuries ago. Um, what comes next? Uh, this is where the Baha'i faith has a position. Um, although I don't and cannot claim to state with any authority what the Baha'i position is. So what I will be offering is a Baha'i position on the Enlightenment, not the Baha'i position on the Enlightenment. And that's uh, an important point to keep uh, to keep in mind. But I think it's, it's, it's fair to say that the Baha'i faith sees itself as the next stage in the spiritual and material evolution of the planet. It doesn't see itself solely as a um, as a spiritual renaissance, although it does see itself as a spiritual renaissance. At the same time, it sees itself as inaugurating a new stage in the physical organization of the planet as well, and it does so through through the means of the of the order of the order of Baha'u'llah, the administrative order, which in its nascent form, in its very embryonic form, uh, is is in place in Baha'i communities. Uh, around the world. The Baha'i writings and the central figures of the Baha'i faith, when it comes to questions of the Enlightenment, although the Enlightenment as a, as a topic, because this is really a construction of historians and sociologists, uh, is not spoken of per se in the Baha'i writings, um, but the Baha'i writings, when it comes to Enlightenment thought and ideals, which very much did impact uh, uh, upon uh, uh, in, in the world and upon the, the early followers um, of, of the Baha'i faith who were, um, who were engaging in these ideas, uh, it doesn't take an extreme position on it. Um, and we'll, t we'll discuss some features of the Baha'i faith um, in connection to modernity and the enlightenment um, in the in the slides that come. But one thing I want to point out is that the Baha'i faith historically emerges from the context of 19th century Persia, Iran, um, a country that had only just begun to feel the impact of the West and of the Western ideals of enlightenment and was still in, in, in many ways quite medieval in its outlook politically, socially, absolutely uh, religiously. And so in this context, it's quite astonishing to see how the Baha'i teachings anticipate progressive movements and ideas in the West. I want to, in this talk, and this is the, the core of my, of my presentation, discuss three features of this astonishing modernity of, of the Baha'i faith, which are, I believe, in so deeply, uh, so deeply resonant with the fundamental principles of the Enlightenment. The first of these has, has to do with the question of what kind of a thing is religion? Because if there's one thing that the Enlightenment has, has done for religion, it has completely undermined the traditional concept of religion as being something which is a top-down phenomenon, something which is revealed from God into the mouth of the prophet, an infallible body of knowledge and wisdom, which is delivered to a chosen human receptacle, and which is then translated into documents, scriptures, uh, which preserve that, um, the impulse of, of, that, of that knowledge, uh, which, which is fundamentally seen as a supernatural event. It's it's seen as something which is a um, which is contrary to the to the normal operation of things when the prophet appears. Uh, the, the act of divine revelation is seen in in, in traditional terms as something which, um, by virtue of its uh, divine and, and supernatural origin, um, then quite quite nece quite necessarily contains information uh, which may. Um, which may be at odds with information collected by other means. So this is a traditional way of looking at religion and, uh, and uh, of religious knowledge and, and wisdom. And here's where the Baha'i teachings have, I think, a very spectacularly modern take. 
and that is that religion is defined in the Baha'i writings um, in both ways. In some ways, you can find it defined, at least implicitly, as a revelation from God, you know, in the very traditional sense. This is words of God revealed to the prophet. But one finds a complementary way of understanding and defining religion, much more consonant with um, much more consonant with uh, the scientific view of the world, the view a view of the world in in, in which rationality is the um, is the core principle. Uh, and this way of looking at religion uh, is is neatly summarized by Abdu'l Baha in his in his book Some Answered Questions, where he where he asked a question about the nature of the knowledge of the prophets of God. Um, of course, the implication being, you know, isn't what the prophets know some sort of magical or supernatural knowledge? And Abdu'l-Baha responds, well, briefly, the universal manifestations of God are aware of the truths underlying the mysteries of all created things. And thus they found a religion that is based upon and consonant with the prevailing condition of humanity. For religion consists in the necessary relationships deriving from the realities of things. This is a truly, truly modern redefinition of, of, of religion. It's something which is emergent, something which is bottom up, uh, contrasted to top down. I don't want to say it's opposed to top down because you find both languages in the Baha'i writings. And that's, I think, one of the things that, and, and we're going to get to this in the, in the, in the third point, but focusing on this bottom up emergent nature of it, it also implies that, um, it implies something about the progressive nature of it as well, because if religion is an expression of interrelationships, since those interrelationships are in this constant state of change, progress, evolution in the physical world, because human relationships, the structures of society and so forth, the movement of peoples, it's in a constant state of froth and movement, then, uh, then one would expect if, if, if religion is an expression of, the, of those interrelationships, then it ought to itself be a dynamic and progressive and changing thing, not something which is crystalline and fixed that is you know, sent down in all its perfection from above uh, and then treasured in its fixity. Rather, it's something which is moving, dynamic, in flux and flowing. And this is how Abdu'l-Bahá describes the, um, the, this, uh, the, this inspiration uh, which underlies religion. It's, um, it emerges from these necessary relationships. Uh, and very allied to this idea of religion is uh, another you know, stunning redefinition uh, of, of religion. And this is by the House of Justice in the, in the Statement of One Common Faith. Uh, the statement was commissioned by the House of Justice uh, about 10 years uh, now, I guess about 15 years ago. It says, Baha'u'llah has not brought into existence a new religion to stand beside the present multiplicity of sectarian organizations. Rather, has he recast the whole conception of religion as the principal force impelling the development of consciousness. So this is another way of redefining what kind of a thing religion is that makes it something dynamic, which makes it something which, because ultimately it's about the development of consciousness, since consciousness is on this arc of upward development, at least as far as we can see on this planet, if only from the fossil record from the last billion or so years, uh, conscious, the complexity of life on this planet has been on an overall upward trend. Uh, and with that complexity, presumably consciousness in its various degrees has emerged with, with that complexity. Now, this overall upward trend does not imply a kind of rigid linearity. There are, there are, you know, within the upward trend, there are rises and falls. There are moments, uh, great extinctions, um, the strikes of, of meteors, such as, such as the one that, uh, that, that destroyed, uh, that made the dinosaurs go extinct. Um, so there are cosmic events uh, and, other, and other events, uh, perhaps even emerging from volcanic processes under, under the earth. Uh, which lead to changes in the atmosphere of the earth, changes in, in climate and, and mass extinctions. So the, this trend of things towards consciousness, this development of consciousness of which human religion is a part, 
know, historically within the past few thousand years that we, you know, that we have memory of it, we can think of that as one piece of this larger cosmic trend towards consciousness, which all can be thought of as the religion of God. It can all be thought of as, as, um, as the, as the, the force of the divine in the, you know, in, in the universe that tends to bring about its own recognition. We can say theologically that the, that the purpose of all of this consciousness emerging and arising and evolving is that it ultimately comes to uh, an understanding and recognition of its own origin point. Again, in theological language, we can say, as, as Baha'u'llah says, you know, in, in the voice of the divine, I love thy creation, therefore I created thee, in the hidden words. It was through this act of, of love and recognition prior to the creation that was the motive force of, of, of creation. And, and the reciprocal motive force is the movement of creation to recognize that, um, that uh, reality of the creator, which is in one way out there in the universe, in another way, it's within every soul. It's the spark that lies within every soul. It is both transcendent and imminent at the same time. This is a, 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 an idea of, of, of religion then, uh, to, to reiterate, not, not something which is um, a fixed body of dogmas, which is delivered, but rather something which is a living and vibrant uh, thing that tends towards the, to impel the development of consciousness. And its ultimate source then, the, the, the source, uh, the inspiration that speaks through uh, the prophets throughout history is ultimately that same source of inspiration that inspires the great art and science that we have. Uh, Abdu'l-Bahá says in, in Paris Talks that all art is a, is the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Um, of course, religion is also the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. You know, we can talk about you know levels and gradations of that of that inspiration, uh, and whether we we should you know slice off one category and 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 elevate it from the others. But ultimately, the the sources of these great human advancements in consciousness is is all the same spiritual source. So that's one way in which the Baha'i writings offer a, a vision of religion, which is, I think, beautifully consonant with the ideas, um, this sort of more enlightenment I ideals um, of, of, uh, of everything being interconnected uh, every, by, by these, um, by, by the forces that, that underlie uh, everything from the atomic level all, all the way on up. The second point I want to make, and I've labeled this um, the open society, is another way in which, and this is, I think, a really key point to, to, to get, a way in which the Baha'i teachings um, very much contrast with traditional religious conceptions. And I understand in saying traditional religious conceptions, I'm, I'm lumping a huge variety and diversity of beliefs into one thing and saying this is traditional religion. So forgive me for that. Um, but I think from the, our Western context, we can understand uh, collectively what, what we're talking about, which is the absolute truth of the church, the absolute power and authority of the church, um, which uh, historically has given really no room for individual interpretation, has given really no room for individual freedom and autonomy. Um, whereas in the Baha'i writings, we have these indications of that, that the right of the individual to make spiritual choices based upon their own reasoning and intuition is, is enshrined within the cause of the, of, of the creator at this stage in our evolution. That the through line of human consciousness leads to increasing individual autonomy to what we in the West call freedom and liberty, exercised in a reasonable and a responsible way. Um, Abdu'l-Bahá says regarding consultation that it's through the clash of differing opinions that the shining spark of truth is ignited. You can't have differing opinions without having fully formed individuals with opinions of their own 
which have been derived from their own individual experience and having a forum in which these opinions can be expressed openly. Um, another uh, statement uh, in, in relation to this um, assumption of greater autonomy by individuals comes from a statement by the House of Justice back in 1988. And they connect this, they, they were asked a question about gray areas in the teachings in which it's not exactly clear whether a particular thing is forbidden or allowed. And they take up this question and they say, it's always been the case that there are gray areas and that it's been a human tendency to want to fill in these gray areas with all of the rules that define in a black and white way what you can and can't do. And then the House of Justice concludes by saying the following, this is the age in which mankind must attain maturity. And one aspect of this is the assumption by individuals of the responsibility for deciding with the assistance of consultation, their own course of action in areas which are left open by the law of God. So there's a, a concept of openness and, uh, and autonomy to decide certain things in the moral sphere that, that is a sacred right of individuals. Whereas in the past, it might've been something that the clerics would have gradually said, okay, th this question has come up enough times, this is the answer. And there are volumes and volumes of laws written in, uh, in, in past religions that define to the nth degree what you, what you can and can't do. Um, and the House of Justice has stated that there is space in this revelation, especially uh, devoted to preserving that individual autonomy. A third area uh, in which we have this much greater range of ind individual autonomy is, is embedded implicitly in the message of the Book of Certitude, Baha'u'llah's Kitab -e Igan, in which he describes the, um, the rejection of the prophets of the past, uh, the reason for the rejection of the prophets of the past, which has always been the clergy, those who are in, uh, or, uh, who, who have the religious power. Um, and Baha'u'llah implicitly gives the individuals in his Book of Certitude the power to resist the clergy. He gives them the spiritual responsibility to read with their own minds and make their own decisions in spiritual matters and to follow the consequences of, of those decisions. In that sense, the Kitab Yagan is such a revolutionary work because it runs against the grain of conformity, which was the religious rule of the day in, 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 and, and the culture in which Baha'u'llah uh, arose to come out and say individual is on their own spiritual path and they should view with suspicion what the clergy says because it's historically been the case that the clergy has been responsible for the denial and persecution of prophets of God in the past. That that is a, a very subversive idea when you think about it. Uh, and it's idea and it's an idea which um, uh, which really implies uh, a, a much greater range uh, of uh, of individual autonomy than has been in the case that, that has been the case in the past. The third and last point I wanted to bring up is the idea of progress. Um, it's often said that the Enlightenment uh, and Enlightenment values are based on an idea of progress. That human civilization is on this upward trajectory, uh, and uh, aided by reason, every generation is always going to be a bit farther along than the generation that came before, particularly because now we have this way of organizing our knowledge, the scientific method, that builds upon all of the knowledge of the past. People were writing books for, you know, for, for as long as writing has been around, thousands of years. But it really wasn't until the emergence of the scientific method and its application during the scientific revolution that we had for the first time bodies of knowledge being accumulated and made available to a larger community of researchers who could then build upon this knowledge and so that every generation could be could could build upon the advances of those that, uh, those that came before and this idea of, of progress then which results from that has been kind of embedded in the enlightenment narrative as as almost like a rule of nature um, of course there is no rule of progress uh, at least one that we can discern but I think it's interesting that the Baha'i writings seem to suggest that on a cosmic level, 
there is something like a rule of progress. And uh, we I, I mean it in this sense. In, in the past, the, the uh, conceptions of religion were very much tied to time and place. They were unchanging and crystallized. The laws, the sacred books, and that made religious communities of the past fundamentally backward looking. If you wanted to get closer to the truth, you would get to, to get as close as possible to the truth, you would want to be there at the moment your prophet revealed those words that many hundreds or thousands of years ago. That would be your closest possible approach to the truth, would be going back in time to that point when the truth was delivered. The problem with that is that in an evolving society in which the needs are constantly changing, in which the social structures are constantly uh, moving forward, um, anything that is said in a particular holy book becomes increasingly out of sync with the needs of the age. The Baha'i writings recognize this. They recognize this as being the problem with religion in the past. That The problem with all religions in the past is that they take on a kind of fixity that prevents them from evolving in accordance with the needs of the day. And so the Baha'i writings, and Baha'u'llah in particular, has put in place in his book of laws a way that guarantees the future evolution and flexibility of the cause that he's inaugurated. And what he's done is he has brought into being an institution, which he calls the House of Justice, which he has given all necessary power to legislate according to the requirements of the day. This will allow his cause to evolve and to map onto the progress of society, of society as a whole, maybe even to catalyze and be and be at the forefront, um, as Shoghi Effendi has said in one of his uh, in one of his letters, the cause has within it everything necessary to allow it to remain at the forefront of all progressive movements. So this is the destiny that Baha'u'llah saw for it, and I think part of this destiny is because for Baha'u'llah and for the Bab also the twin the twin founders of the Baha'i faith. There is a kind of cosmic line of progress that runs through all things. And that cosmic line of, pro of, of progress can be summarized as everything comes from the one by a process of divine emanation, like the rays of light emanating from the sun. Uh, and at the same time, everything returns to the one. And the whole universe viewed cosmically, viewed in that kind of spiritual lens, is in a continual process as a process of emerging from and returning to the one. Abdu'l-Baha calls this the circle of existence. And he describes the circle of existence comprising arcs of descent and arcs of ascent, uh, corresponding roughly to what we would call the material world and the spiritual world. Um, and that overall circle of existence, this emanative circle, gives shape and structure to cosmic history to human history over the millennia and also to our own personal lives. Everything is recapitulates in microcosm this grand movement of the cosmos, which is an emanative arc and a returning arc. I'll just say it as, as an aside that meditative practices developed to a very high form in the East, very much focus on the breath and the circularity of the breath as one of their, as one of their primary techniques. The breathing in and the breathing out is completing a circuit. It's completing a circle, which is a microcosmic you know, replica of the cosmic circle of everything. And when one focuses on that and gets lost in that circuit of the breath, one resonates with the, the harmonies of the cosmos in a way. Uh, and so it can be very practically an aid to, to meditation. So that was the third point I wanted to make is the is the idea that progress is really embedded in the Baha'i teachings and in our vision uh, for for humanity. Uh, this is a quote that I paraphrased just a few minutes ago uh, about being at the forefront of all progressive movements, which uh, which is enabled by this institution of the of the House of Justice. So to try to pull things together and, and sum up, uh, what would what then would the Baha'i faith say about the Enlightenment. I can only say what a Baha'i, this Baha'i you know, thinks uh, all of this adds up to. 
And it would be something like this, that the Enlightenment uh, and the age of the Enlightenment in which we can truly say we presently live was and is a great leap forward in human consciousness, not without its faults and excesses, its over-reliance on reason, for example, to the exclusion of intuition, uh, its attempt to universalize to the exclusion of the diversity of human experience. There are faults in the Enlightenment that as with previous stages in human progress, it will be followed by other leaps forward that partly correct the, the missteps that came before, partly build upon the, the, the great advances of, of what came before. But we can see the Enlightenment, as Kant did in the quotation that I gave at the very beginning, as our collective adolescence, to be followed naturally by our maturity. Um, and in, I think the, the imagery of adolescence, which Baha'is, most Baha'is are, are already well familiar with, is such a, a good metaphor for this process because it's through it's during the age of adolescence that, that the child realizes for the first time their autonomy. They realize, hey, I don't have to follow the rules. They have, and they break the rules to see what happens. Uh, and their minds have developed to, to a degree that now they're able to function with a kind of autonomy that they weren't able uh, to function with before. The age of adolescence at the human scale has its excesses, has its uh, its its problems, and its um, but it it gives way ultimately to maturity, uh, in which in which one realizes the wisdom of the laws that that we that we collectively follow for the sake of uh, greater harmony. Um, the same laws that we ourselves might have broken during our adolescent years. So I think it's a great uh, a great metaphor. And I think what this overall picture translates into, because all this metaphysical thinking has to translate into something practical on the ground. Uh, and what I'd like to, to suggest is that these three points that I've brought up, this point of interconnectedness, uh, the point of individual autonomy and questioning authority, uh, and the point of, um, of progress, of seeing things in terms of a progressive arc, um, can, can all be mapped onto what the Baha'i community is doing practically and pragmatically on the ground today, which is releasing the society building powers of, of strong and thriving communities. You know, for as much as we can think globally and, and, and we're aided by, by thinking on, on a universal level, we have to act locally, and acting locally means building thriving communities, finding points of connection with others in our community, because a community is a network, an interconnected network of people that are moving in some um, with some sort of common purpose. It means reading our own reality, asking the hard questions about how it can be improved, and that demands a degree of individual autonomy. And it also means moving forward in unity to and progressing to a higher state of love and consciousness and ultimately to uh, that, that greater world civilization, a civilization of, of peace that we all long for. So I will, I'll stop at that point and take questions and comments and reactions. Thank you so very much, Dr. Phelps. I must admit it was, I mean, if words fail me, but it was fantastic, earth shattering. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. Uh, there are, uh, if, if you want to take away your, uh, yeah, then we can see who raised. Uh, hands and also there are questions in the chat. Perfect. Would it be possible for us to have this um, presentation if you can send it to us? Oh, ab absolutely. Although I, I, I apologize for its state. It literally was just cutting and pasting some speaker notes onto some slides by the end. So I mean, I'm I'm embarrassed to share it, but if if you think it would be useful, then then I'm, I'm happy to. Okay, there are so many thanks to you in the chat, but, but we, um, 
let me pause. Here. I mean, where does he say? I think it's in the Epistle of the Son of the Wolf. He says, the blade of the tongue is sharper than swords of steel. You know, so we were to put away the, the sword, you know, the literal sword, on the first day of Rezvan. But the sword of the tongue remains. And that's the, you know, that's that's how this shining spark of truth comes about. You know, the clash of the swords of of the tongues, of, of differing opinions, brings, brings a higher truth in, into being. Um, so... In a way, conflict has been sublimated in this revelation. You know, before it was bloody and animalistic, but you can't do away with conflict. You know, this is the realm. There's a, a beautiful talk by Abdu'l-Baha recently posted to the Baha'i Reference Library website, where he talks about everything is is eater or eaten. This is the law of the universe. He says, you know, we're in this world, and the world is a realm of conflict, and it's a world of eat or be eaten, uh, and that's. That's the way it is. We're not solving that, you know. No, no divine revelation, no, no religion is going to solve the fundamental parameters of the physical world, which is that there is struggle, there's struggle for existence, and there's conflict. Be, because it's out of the it is out of that conflict, it's out of the that process of struggle that consciousness becomes sublimated, that consciousness is is thrust forward into the to the next level of its. Uh, uh, of its development, it can't happen without without it. It's like the it's it's like the um, there's a, there's a great uh, video clip of a of of some rabbi on on YouTube which I saw where he talks about a lobster and he says you know the lobster always has to regrow its shell it has to drop the old shell and regrow its new shell from time to time and the thing that triggers it to regrow that shell is the great discomfort of being trapped inside this shell that's become too small for it. And it's the pain and discomfort of being cramped inside this thing that uh, that triggers it to, to cast it off and regrow a new one. It's you know one of the many ways in which in which suffering is a necessary spiritual catalyst. Mm -hmm. I don't think Baha'is would subscribe to the spiritual point of view that that suffering is an unmitigated evil that the that our object should be to escape entirely from I, I see i see that in some spiritual practices you know suffering is bad and and here's a path to to avoid all suffering i don't know the baha'i prayer books have a whole section on tests and difficulties and that section on tests and difficulties is not about it is not about releasing yourself from it it's about bringing them on <laughs> because it's only through through experiencing them that uh, that's that's my interpretation of it. Yeah. It brings them on because it's through it's through it, it's through passing through them that one uh, that one develops to to the higher levels. Thank you so much, Doctor yeah. Hassan. Thank you so much. Uh, one more, one more question. There are other friends who would like to ask questions, <laughs> but if, yeah, why don't we ask others to to ask their questions and then. May I come back to you, Dr. Hissam? I'm very yeah. grateful that you participated sure, tonight. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, very much. Thank God, you. Thank thank you so you much. Much. I am waiting for my third question. Thank you, Dr. Sardari. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah. Farideh Khanum, go for it. Okay, thank you very much for your presentation. And uh, because you was working in the research department of the House of Justice, for sure you know Mr. Ed. Ed is the director of the uh, archives in the Baha'i House of Worship. I, I see him all the time. And then, because you were saying that is uh, all the time the manifestation of God comes, the clergy, the priests against them. That is, and also it's happening now. And now I, I want to mention uh, there was a lady in the, in the Winter Park, Florida, we was living. Her name was Marguerite. She died two years ago. She was 107 years old. She met the beloved guardian, and she said one of the questions the pilgrimage asked beloved guardian, next manifestation of God come after 1,000, that Universal House of Justice will recognize them. Beloved guardian said yes. Mankind is very mature that beloved God, uh, Universal House of Justice will recognize the next manifestation of God. And because right now was international convention, whole world excited and cry and happiness. Now you work in the research department. 
Do you know anything more about information of the thousand, the one thousand that golden age come maturity of mankind? No priest and no missionary. Just I want if you know something. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, Farida Khan. We really appreciate it. Go ahead. Thank you. Please. Yeah, I, there's yeah. there's not much on it. I mean, two two little tidbits uh, that I have seen and heard. One is the thousand years may actually is just the lower end. You know, it may be thousands. So we're not, it's not like start your stopwatches and then as soon as a thousand years have gone by, start, start, you know, looking around, although I'm sure that will happen, but um, there, there's no guarantee in terms of time frame, no, no one knows for sure. The second very interesting tidbit actually comes from um, a tablet of Baha'u'llah, uh, which is uh, among the unpublished writings, but it's published in the, in the Persian. And Baha'u'llah talks about the, the nature of, of divine revelation in the future. And I think it's actually relevant to AI and GPT and all of these chatbots and things that we're seeing now, because modern day AI is already generating um, language to rival any human language. And um, if you want, you could try this little experiment, go to chat GPT-4, not 3.5 when it becomes available, uh, and ask it to like generate quotations, you know, the the quote, quotations as though they were from the Baha'i writings. And it can produce quotations that sound like they were from Baha'u'llah, but they're not. But they have all the Baha'i ideas in it, and they're written in the, in the language of the, of the Guardian's translations. So chatbots can already produce language that contain that seemingly contains you know ideas you know th th that are similar to the ones we, we already are familiar with so this tablet of Baha'u'llah says that that in the past it's the divine verses that have been the proof of the of the prophets and Baha'u'llah says in this tablet in the future however um, because everyone will be speaking the divine verses we will ordain another proof a different proof for the for the prophet to come so whatever the proof is it's not going to be divine verses uh, because they're going to be common and i i just wonder maybe i'm putting uh, crossing the wires here but you know i'm 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 looking at this very very early you know instantiation of artificial intelligence and wondering you know where's this going to be just five generations from now or 10 generations from now um you it'll be it'll be hard for us mortals to distinguish between you know, something that was revealed and something that's been generated by an AI that has access to all human knowledge. Thank you. It's an interesting thing to think about. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you. Um, Dr. Farabi, please go ahead. Yes. First of all, thank you very much. It was a very enlightened speech. Uh, I would like to receive the recording if it is possible. I think uh, most of us would like to, to have. Concerning that uh, you, you mentioned about Europeans talking about enlightenment and uh, Mrs. Emel talked about indigenous people in America, but we must never forget that there were a number of philosophers even Baha'u'llah mentioned one or two of them, like Rumi, like Chayyam, like, you know, Hafez from, uh, you know, the creator of the faith, who also had a lot of enlightenment and they talked about enlightenment. So it wasn't only purely uh, exclusive to the Europeans or the other, yeah, low or, indigenous America, but it was it probably was all over the world, probably in India or even in Greece or et cetera, et cetera. And uh, finally, I have a completely, um, a kind of a understanding, which is based on Baha'u'llah's writing which may or may not have a little uh, issue with this, with your presentation. And that is Baha'u'llah emphasized in uh, the, the uh, uh, Hidden Words, Seven Valleys and kitab -e iran a lot about the purity of the heart. And the fact that 
it is through the heart which we can understand. He talks, I have seen it many times, and I'm sure we all have. Baha'u'llah talks about wisdom of the heart or a ponder in your heart or even my first counsel is this, possess a pure, kindly and radiant heart, etc. Hmm. So we must never put that as apart. You know, without a pure heart, I don't believe any of these things uh, will be established. And, and uh, forgive me for being lengthy, but just finally, we we'll also have to remember, Baha'u'llah said that, uh, that the world is in travel and his agitation is increased day by day until the appointed time comes that it will be, the old order will be wrapped up and the new world order will be in its place. So it is not only one side of the story. It is, we have to look at all of these aspects. Thank you, sorry for being lengthy. Oh, thank you, I, I completely agree. It's certainly not the case that the exercise of reason alone is uh, is going to extricate us from the current plight of humanity, uh, or that it's even the key to spiritual progress. Uh, the I think the, the a key metaphor which helps here is this again this imagery of the of the circle of existence, this the arcs of ascent and descent, which Abdu'l-Bahá in one of his talks says that um, that if you're the to, to the mineral to the uh, to the vegetable, he says the animal is the spiritual reality. So. If, if we are on this sort of circle of existence and we're progressing from the mineral kingdom to spiritual degrees, then wherever you are on that circle of existence, the thing that's ahead of you is your is the spiritual reality. You know, to the vegetable, the animal is the spiritual reality. And conversely, whatever's behind you is the material reality. And the metaphor is often used in the writings for what is behind you is because you're the sum total of, of, of all the evolution up into that point, in some way you encompass it our minds grasp and surround and encompass the physical world. And that is metaphorically how we can understand so much of the physical world, because we are bigger than it in a way. Our minds are, are as small as they are inside our skulls. In a way, they embrace the whole universe on, on the physical dimension. But that's only looking like backwards along the arc of descent. Looking forwards, it's a different faculty that comes into play that which is the one you were talking about um and that faculty is the faculty of the heart and that faculty is not a faculty of grasping surrounding controlling embracing that's a faculty of reflecting it's the mirror of the heart which is able to reflect the image of a reality which is much greater than it you know the mirror of our hearts reflect the image of the sun which is infinitely greater than than the, and that mirror must be purified and burnished so that it can so that it can reflect that that light of the sun most faithfully so we have these two complementary metaphors in in the bahai writings one the metaphor of surrounding and grasping which is the power of the mind which is the whole french enlightenment and everything that that i've been you know talking about this session but complementary to that is this more intuitive faculty of perception of spiritual perception which is the which is the power of ultimately that that of reflecting something which which is much greater um and both of them are necessary in the in in the world it is that intuitive faculty which is the which is the one which is aligned with spiritual progress and it's the absence of that in the in the west which is um which is i think rightly one of the greatest uh criticisms of what has come out of the enlightenment is it's you know one isn't criticizing the power of the mind or the ability to to build you know faster airplanes and so forth, but one is criticizing the the effective loss of or lack of development of this complementary faculty, the intuitive faculty, which in a way is more important, you know, because uh, it's not more important as regards surviving on this physical plane, for that. The mind, the mind is enough. You can live like an animal and and do and uh, and thrive as the animals thrive. But if you want to thrive as a human being, can potentially thrive. 
it requires that that faculty of, of intuition, which wasn't the the primary topic of of this uh, of, of this presentation. And so, I I certainly wouldn't want to to leave you with the idea that um, the the Baha'i writings only talk about the the power of the mind and and uh, uh, and how great it is. There are That's always it. other firesides, Stephen. Thank you so much. I'm just writing down all the titles. Uh, so for next time, we would we would ask you to come. I just, before I let Sherwin um, ask his question, I would like to let everyone know that I met Dr. Phelps in another fireside while I had listened to his talks, many, many talks, and understood probably 3% of every talk. When he's, he speaks Farsi, to me, it's the most beautiful and the most unbelievable thing in the world. And he delves into the tablets of Baha'u'llah in Farsi. And I just get these shock waves every five minutes. But with the person he is, I, I asked him in that fireside if I could have his email. And he said yes. And he accepted to come here within probably a week or two. I am indebted to you, not only because of your knowledge. Really, uh, Stephen, I want you to know that your humility and, and the way that you deal with other people has, has amazed me to no death. Let me tell you, Stephen, we love you very much. This can can explain our feelings to you. Thank you so much. There are few people whom I can say this, but anyways, thank you very much. Uh, Sherwin, go for it. Hi, thank you very much for the wonderful talk. Um, one point that Dr. Phelps mentioned that reson resonated with me was at the time of the revelation, it's always the forces of progression versus the forces of tradition. And that makes a lot of sense. Now, if I, I just want to make sure I heard correctly, when you were given example of the forces of tradition, you mentioned Socrates and Plato both in the same category, or did I mishear that? Um. I can't. I mean, I can't Aristotle, remember. Aristotle, and Ptolemy. Aristotle. Uh, yes. I, oh, Aristotle and Ptolemy. What changes? Baha'u'llah had such a beautiful quote for this, which has it kind of gone, uh, kind of gone missing. It was translated by Shoghi Effendi and published in an early Baha'i journal. And then, as far as I know, it was kind of lost, and nobody quoted it until until more recently. Um, but to paraphrase it, Baha'u'llah says that. All the rules and laws of the religions over the ages have changed, except for one thing, he says, which is the law of love, which, he says, like a fountain, is ever flowing and is constantly being refreshed. So he perfectly captures both the idea of the changeless faith of God, there's the, the changeless thing is the law of love, always there. But even that changeless thing is in the site and is in a state, is in a dynamic state. It's always being refreshed, it's always flowing, just like a fountain of water. It's not stagnant, it's like it's it's in motion. And so that's um I you know, what, what an inspired way of capturing both the idea of something that's changeless but at the same time dynamic. Yeah, and and, and it seems like at the time, at each time these religions bring their own civilization to the highest of the peaks. So that happened with the Jews, they went, they were slaves, but then they become to the times of reaching the times of David and Solomon. And then Christ brings his own manifestation, his own uh, revelation and brings to the top. And when, when Europe was in the medieval ages, in the dark ages, <laughs> Muhammad followers were doing science, were doing, so it's not that the whole idea of humanity were completely on dark side there's always been pockets where the faith where the where the holy spirit of the time has been doing its effect but now that holy spirit mm -hmm. effect 
is universal, is not limited by the location, but is for the whole globe. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Friends, are there any more questions? Uh-huh, Dr. Hissam. So Dr. Hissam, uh, why don't I ask my question first? Because I waited okay. <laughs> for a long time. And then at the end, maybe uh, we know each other, by the way. Yes. Uh, yes. So I don't know how to articulate my thoughts. Uh, we're talking about post enlightenment religion, a religion like the Baha'i faith with all the complexities that you included in your talk. Yet, you go to different parts of Africa or Belize, now that Louise and Bob are here, and to other, other countries, and you see that teachers are sitting with young and old, talk about the Baha'i faith as if this is grade one stuff. And they understand and they relate. I want you to explain to me this elasticity that a religion has that could accommodate almost the two different, you, you know what I mean? I'm sure you know what I mean. Yeah, well, that was a whole, that was a whole section of my lack of time. Um, but there were a few other slides I was going to do, which I didn't have time to. Uh, and one of the, one of the slides was absolutely on this point about the elasticity of how, um, of how the message can be delivered with different voices to different populations. And that's one of the, I think, truly unique things about Baha'u'llah's revelation, that he himself did not want it to be confined to one particular story angle, to, to, for lack of a, better, of a better phrase. And where he makes this very explicit in all places is in the Baghdad period tablets, which he writes on mystical themes. The Seven Valleys, the Four Valleys, Jawaharl Asrar, or the Gems of Divine Mysteries, and a few other tablets which are included in this recently published volume uh, called, um, oh my God, what was it called? Someone can remind me. Loher Huriye and Immortal Youth. The, well, those are included among the mystical works, but it's called Ca Councils of the Divine Beloved or something like that. Uh, it includes the, the refreshed translations of the seven valleys and four valleys, plus a number, a, a few other, a few other smaller tablets. So Jim. what Baha'u'llah does in these, in these mystical works is, I think, really revolutionary, kind of, kind of subversive to the way people would maybe traditionally think about the, the topic of spiritual search and the spiritual quest. Because traditionally, they would think about it as the seeker starts in the, uh, in the valley of search, and then they pro progress through these different valleys to get to the end. And the implication being everyone is somewhere, you know, everyone is on this, you know, is, is uh, progressing somewhere in, in, this, in these valleys. Uh, and, and the one is, you know, farther along and higher than the other. And um, so you have progression from ignorance to knowledge. But I, if you look sort of more closely at how Baha'u'llah describes these, these valleys, particularly I think Gems of Divine Mysteries has a, some, some really nice examples. And I talk about this in some of my other talks. He, he isn't so much saying this valley is better than that valley. He's saying different kinds of seekers occupy different valleys. And that's part of the human condition. In other words, some people will always be in Valley A and other people will always be in Valley B. It's a matter of their spiritual um, personality, so to speak. The one way Baha'u'llah puts it in the Seven Valleys is you have, you, have, you have those who look through the eye of distinction and you have those who see through the eye of unity. And in particular, these valleys of distinction, he says, are the first three, search, love, knowledge, and the valleys of unity are knowledge, you know, contentment, wonderment, true poverty, and absolute nothingness. 
Uh, and so he divide he himself divides the seven values into these two different overall categories of those who see things in terms of the, the separateness analytically, you know, the eye of distinction, and you have those who see through the eye of unity. They're always looking at the oneness behind things. They're maybe more intuitive, uh, more more synthetic in their in their thinking. But Baha'u'llah doesn't say so much one is better than the other. I mean, I suppose you could you could extract from that this idea that you know it's it is it's somewhat more I don't know mature to to, to or, or advanced in some way to see through the eye of unity than, than through the eye of distinction. But he also explicitly says that these perspectives are all true and correct within their own station. And in one of these newly translated mystical tablets, in uh, now I have to now I actually have to get it because I I've forgotten the title. Um, it's, it's in the call of the divine beloved, and the 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 quotation I'm thinking about is from one of these newer tablets that uh, that you might not have been aware of, but it's tablet number three. Paragraph six on page 60 of uh, the Call of the Divine Beloved. It looks like this in translation. It's quite a small volume. It includes the seven valleys and the four valleys. And in this tablet, which is full of some amazing mystical, mystical statements, he says, since all do not possess the same degree of spiritual understanding, certain statements will inevitably be made, and there shall arise as a consequence as many differing opinions as there are human minds, and as many divergent beliefs as there are created things. This is certain and settled and can in no wise be averted. And then he goes on in the next paragraph to say what to do about it. He says, our aim is that thou shouldst urge all the believers to show forth kindness and mercy and to overlook certain shortcomings among them. The differences may be dispelled, true harmony be established, and the censure and reproach, the hatred and dissension seen among the peoples of former times may not arise anew. So he's saying here that there's a kind of a, like a ground floor diversity that is a feature and not a bug of human existence. And this is this goes deep. It's not just some people like like sushi and some people like hamburgers. It's like some people like fundamentally see the world, let's say, through a very conservative lens, and other people see the world through a, a much more liberal or progressive lens. And we're not we're not there isn't a fight. It's not like one of these is going to win. It's like these are different aspects of human behavior and human being in the world, all of which need to be understood and validated within their own perspective. Now, of course, we need to actually go forward in the world. So that means decisions have to be made. And maybe one perspective, you know, is takes precedence over another perspective at a certain time within a certain situation and, and a certain context. But that's the job of spiritual assemblies and houses of justice. That's the whole pu purpose of the administrative order and having a consultative framework and bringing together a diversity of beliefs, which is why houses of justice have to have at least nine people, if not more. Um, so that you guarantee some minimum diversity of, of opinion, and then you decide and you go forward. And then if situation changes tomorrow, you make a different decision. It's like such a flexible framework, and it's such a, a beautiful and simple way of, of, of resolving the problem. But in a way, it's not a problem. You know, diversity is not a problem. You know, viewed from this perspective, it's the greatest strength of humanity is, is this diverse, diversity of perspective. But we mistakenly see it as a problem. We mistakenly see it as um, as the thing we have to solve. And particularly when we look at this from the perspective of religion, it's so, so toxic. You know, the idea that, well, we have the truth, this religious community has the truth, and everyone else is benighted, ignorant, don't even know, it may be bad faith, who knows, but, you know, it's our job to to bring everyone into our understanding of how things are. And that's you know, the most toxic thing from, from, from this perspective of what Baha'u'llah is saying. He's saying this diversity can in no wise be averted. It is what it is. So he said, be forgiving with each other, be forbearing, forgive each other. If you you Because you, in your heart of hearts, you think they're, they've gone astray. So he says, forgive these shortcomings of others. But 
it's such a it's such a beautiful it's such a beautiful solution with such a practical thing to do to move forward from there you know it's not it just doesn't stop with the airy fairy just everyone get along and everyone love each other it takes it to the next step which is okay now go and elect your representatives and elect their representatives and build these consultative bodies and go and make the difficult decisions that have to be made in the world and that's the that's the beauty of that's the beauty of the whole structure Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. I know you must be very tired, but we can't say no to Dr. Hassan <laughs> and Mr. Tahir Zadeh. Would you agree with me or are you too briefly, tired? Briefly, briefly. I may have to do a pickup, yes. uh, a child pickup. Sure. Okay. You know, Baha'i rankings are all scientific. Film, write peace every 19 days to venture at Today in the morning and at the dark time, all of these science are proving that these are benefits for human beings, for physical life, as well as now, we know the whole thing for a spiritual life. Now, this is a part of reasoning because it's scientific also, besides being divine. What can we invite the Scientists by dozen, by handling, by two handling, and lay down before them and say, Are you in an open mind? Will you be willing to consider the Baha'i faith if you are a scientist? Well, I think the answer to that after having talk to a lot of scientists, you know, and going through the, you know, being a scientist for a while. Uh, and this would be the same answer, whether it's a, a room full of scientists or a room full of anyone else. People are not looking for the logical reasons to believe in something, you know, they're looking for how it makes them feel. I, this, this is, I think, the reality. And the logic will come later. You know, if they need the logic to backfill and to sort of give them the ground to sort of let them make the decision and make them feel like they made the right decision, they'll find, you know, you'll find the right logical reasons. But the thing that comes first is the hearts have to be touched. You can't sit in front of a room full of people and like have all the right arguments and expect them, expect them to, to agree. Whoever agrees to an argument that you make. If they don't already believe the thing, how com how how rare a thing is it that someone actually changes their mind on a point, especially a fundamental point like this, that they hadn't heard before? If someone just sort of comes up to them and says, "Have you considered this?" Like the number of people capable of changing their minds based on rational arguments is like, scarcer than hen's teeth, but the number of people who can enter into a space in which they feel love and they feel community that's where that's where it all happens that's where the change happens that's how people are convinced yeah. and then nothing convinces you otherwise once you've had that experience mm -hmm. thank you so so much again that's it thank you dr thank sardar thank you such a bounty such an enlightenment <laughs> <laughs> thank you very thank much, Asif. No, thank you, thank you to both love. of you. Can, please give our love to your dear family for us. I have such warm memories of both of you from when I was a child. So I'm, I'm very, very, <laughs> very touched that you're here for oh, this. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the wonderful uh, yeah. presentation. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> give our love to your family. <laughs> Mr. Tahir Zadeh, everyone loves Stephen so much. People come from here and there to express their love. So, Stephen, this is the last question. Mr. Tahir Zadeh, go for it, please. This, for me, this is a practice to ex express this uh, concept, uh, following on what you mentioned as the essential aspects of religion that uh, are permanent but are refreshed so uh, one example that uh, comes to my mind is 
as you, as you mentioned, the principle of love that's constant in, in all religion, uh, revealed religions. But this, this principle of love has been refreshed in this age uh, by the Bab and Baha'u'llah in that now it, 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 it's a key to recognize all the peoples of the world on this, on this small planet. Of course, the planet has shrunk to a, into a village. So now we are face to face with peoples that are totally strange to us, different cultures, ethnicities. Uh, and so the, the key, the, the new refresh, uh, the new refreshing of this principle, essential principle that Baha'u'llah has given us is the tools to, 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 to be, once we are face to face with peoples from the most remote parts of this planet, we instantly invoke the principle that Baha'u'llah gives of that the essential y y y unity of mankind, the oneness of humanity. That's like a, a formula, a spiritual formula that we can invoke and no matter how different they are, we have we can invoke this this principle, and immediately we we see that we are the same, the oneness. We can see the oneness, and and not just the way the missionaries went around the world, uh, uh, and but in 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 this case, in the in this modern case they enjoy the same status meaning there is no superiority or inferiority or any such thing if you sit in a spiritual assembly with um, at any remote place on earth they occupy the same status and we have the, this key that baha'u'llah has given us of the oneness of humanity and when we invoke this we are immediately in a new plane of relationship and consciousness. Thank you. Beautifully said. I can't add anything to that. <laughs> I just wanted to thank you so very much. I know you have to pick up your children. I will read only one of the messages uh, from the chat since it belongs to Joni Babian, my French Canadian sister. She said, so grateful for your commitment to awakening a deeper understanding in this dynamic spiritual life. We are all growing. Thank you for your love and devotion to all of us. And I'll add to it, we love you. And we invite you to come back very soon. Thank you so much, everybody. Stephen, give, give our love to, to your family. And uh, it was such a pleasure that you accepted to be here. Uh, many, many thanks. Thank you very much. We'll see you soon. Thank you so much. The honor was mine. Love you all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Friends, we will continue our session with our devotional. I think we have 10 more minutes. Uh, Joni, that was such a beautiful, beautiful message you put in chat. Thank you, Joni. Thank you so much. Uh, so I'm wondering if... <laughs> Thank I'm, you for... You're very welcome. Uh, friends, uh, we will start our prayers in the, this 10 minutes, a lot of our friends uh, left us from Malaysia and Indonesia and all of this. So may I please ask, uh, Tara, are you there? Tara? Okay. M may, I, may I ask Mrs. Torayas? To, to, to just say a prayer, please.
Rod is there, Sue is there. So maybe Rod, could you start with a prayer? Sure. Oh, Ms. Dr. Hissam is there. Yes, go for it, please. Well, I would like to say a prayer for healing, if you don't mind. There's a lot of uh, sickness and such. Thy name is my healing, O oh my God. And remembrance of thee is my remedy. Nearness to thee is my hope and love for thee, my companion. Thy mercy to me is my healing and my succor both in this world and in the world to come. Thou verily art the all-bountiful, the all-knowing, the all-wise. Oh, Lord, what an outpouring of bounty thou hast vouchsafed. And what a flood of abounding grace thou hast granted. Thou didst make all the hearts to become even as a single heart. And all the souls to be bound together as one soul. Thou didst endow inert bodies with life and feeling, and didst bestow upon lifeless frames the consciousness of the spirit. Through the effulgent rays shed from the day star of the all merciful, thou didst invest these atoms of dust with visible existence and through the billows of the ocean of oneness, thou didst enable these evanescent drops to surge and roar. O almighty one who endowest a blade of straw with the might of a mountain and enablest a speck of dust to mirror forth the glory of the resplendent sun, Grant us thy tender grace and favor, so that we may arise to serve thy cause and not be shamefaced before the peoples of the earth. Alawapa. Dr. Hassan, please go ahead. O oh, Son of Justice, whither can a lover go back to the land of his beloved? And what secret find a rest away from his heart's desire? To the true lover, reunion is life, and separation is death. His breast is void of patience, and his heart has no peace. A never had our lives, a never lives he would forsake to hasten to the abode of his beloved. In the silence of Kulam Osha, Zuzan Batani Mashu, Mahaji Yuzai. Vakulam tole to be matlu rohajuyan. Oh, so so Mahulu Vishon at this tomorrow, Mohadar. 
Mr. Tires, the Hara is here. So if if we have a short prayer, then Tara can actually chant with her heavenly voice. I know, Mr. Tahirzadeh, that you like her voice as well. Yes, I'm, I will be short. Thank you. Thank you. From the hidden words revealed by the Baha'u'llah. O oh, son of being, with the hands of power I made thee, and with the fingers of strength I created thee, and within thee have I placed the essence of my light. Be thou content with it and seek not else for my work is perfect and my command is binding question, question it not nor have a doubt thereof O son of spirit I created thee rich why dost thou bring thyself down to poverty noble i made thee wherewith dost thou abase thyself out of the essence of knowledge i gave thee being why seekest thou enlightenment from anyone beside me out of the clay of love i molded thee how dost thou busy thyself with another? Turn thy sight unto thyself, that thou mayest find me standing within thee, mighty, powerful, and self-subsisting. O son of man, thou art my dominion and my dominion perisheth not wherefore fearest thou thy perishing thou art my light and my light shall never be extinguished why dost thou dread extinction Thou art my glory, and my glory fadeth not. Thou art my robe, and my robe shall never be outworn. Abide then in thy love for me, that thou mayest find me in the realm of glory. Thank you. Tarajan, will you say the, the last prayer, the closing prayer, please? Thank you. Allahum Ey 
Rabbul Malaku In the Fus فسات روح القدس فریاد زنم وزیز و توانا و توی دانا و شنوا و بینا عبدالبها عباس Dear friends, thank you so much for supporting this fireside every Thursday. Mrs. Garda Shem Parisher Jun, thank you for being here. Gibi, 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 we love you, although you don't show your face. Thank you, Gibi, appreciate it. You should have asked the question, but Gibi is my French Canadian sister. But, anyways, we'll forgive you this time. Just say hi. Thank okay, uh, hi, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you, thank you for being here. 
Thank I'm the lucky one. I'm the lucky one. Thank you, Dr. Hissam. Malijun, thank you. Riaz Jan, my brother, for the first time. Thank you for being here. Thank, um, thank you so, so much for this wonderful meeting. Thank you know, Steve, from his young age, and he had been truly a lover of Baha'u'llah, and so you are. And that's why I read the number four. I read for you. And for him. Thank and you. For him. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yes, thank you so much. Bye-bye. Next, bye next time we will have to ask you to say more prayers. Give, no, 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 no. Give my love. <laughs> give my love to Juliet again. Thank you so much. Okay, take care. Take care and thank you. Take care. All the best. Bye -bye. Take care. Okay. Allah -ha. Allah -ha. Allah -ha. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Farabi, thank you so yeah. much. Sue, Sue, Sue. Yeah. It would be great, Sue, if you can send me the link to this tablet of Abdul Baha. Do you think this is possible? Did I lose Sue? No. Okay, you have my email. No, maybe if, maybe if you can send it to me, I would really appreciate it. Thank you, John. Thank you, Mr. Tahir Zadeh. Thank you, thank you, everyone. Tara John Azizam, thank you for being here. You create such a beautiful space for us every week. Mrs. Sarayas, I we didn't hear you say a prayer in the five languages you know, but can mm -hmm. can we see your face at last? Uh, sorry, my my telephone was uh, my iPad was low. Oh, I'm so <laughs> so sorry. It's okay. It's so lovely that at last we saw you. Next time, please come and say prayers for us. Inshallah. 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 Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you so very much. See you next Thursday. Thank you so much. This is Masru. You are a very lovely lady and very elegant um, speaker. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Hussam is very lucky. Tell him I told you that. <laughs> Thank you. 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 Mali John, thank you for being here. John, thank you. Farahnas Khanum, all of you. Rod, Rod, Riaz John. By the way, Mr. Tarzan, my brother's name is Riaz too. He's here too. All the best. Allah Hafa. See you next Allah Hafa. Allah Hafa. Thank you. 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 Bye. Bye. Love, love.